This is off planet radio. Welcome to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna dip our toes today. Well, actually, we're gonna fully immerse into the dark world of pop culture, and uh, do an examination of a lot of things that have to do with that culture's effects on the larger stratum of human consciousness, experience, and what's going on around us. And we got a ripping guest. Emily's here with me. I want to remind you, by the way. The website is offplanetradio.com. You need to start going to that site because increasingly YouTube has become unstable. We've already had one video take down. I suspect that if we put the last show we did up, we'd get our channel ripped off. So offplanetradio.com. And don't forget the Patreon site, which is patreon.com forward slash offplanetmedia. Emily, kick it off. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, good to be back. And you guys have heard me over the last year and a half now or whatever, speaking out increasingly about uh, my own experiences in uh, dance music and the mind control and the programming that's involved in that. And so much of my inspiration has come from our guest this evening, who um, I first heard of him was he was doing the rounds promoting his first book. Uh, and um, he's back today since his second book is out and, and uh, ready for you all to read. And that's Mark Devlin. And we're going to deep, dig uh, deep into what he has found that lies underneath uh, the music that I have loved, that I love, and that I've sort of reported on mostly from my own uh, experiences and my own intuitions. We're going to start there and work our way through, um, you know, the programming involved in all kinds of music, is from, you know, starting with dance music and go work our way sort of backwards to uh, what happened with the new wave movement and 80s pop videos. And we might take another dip into the strange deaths of some of these uh, pop celebrities and whatnot. So Mark Devlin, welcome back to Off Planet Radio. Well, Emily, Randy, good to be back with you and uh, lots to talk about today. There's never any shortage of subjects to get into when you decide to become a researcher in this area. Trust me. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, you know, we were with us, God, it was over a year and a half ago now. We dug into like, you know, just the destruction of hip hop and um, the, you know, strange case of Paul McCartney and some of the other, you know, very bizarre mind control and, you know, cultural programming that lies within the music. And uh, that connection led to you and I doing a lot of chatting about dance music and you, you know, were interested in looking into that and looking into that for, for this new book. So let's start there. And I'm very curious to find, you know, um, some of what you think, I mean, you're more, much more of a researcher than I am. I kind of, I do some research into the technology of it and whatnot, but. Well, you're more of a raver than me. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd call myself a raver, but I'm an underground dance music enthusiast for sure. And, you know, I just, um, you know, and also some of the issues with the mind control background and, and whatever, but I'm really, you know, interested in sharing with the listeners all the things that you found as you took a deep dive into this sort of genre of music that isn't your sort of home turf but, but you know you found I'm, I'm guessing you found a lot of the same things you found in your other endeavors so let's hear it sure well my new book musical truth volume two kicks off with the 30-year anniversary of the uk's acid house movement so we're on that right now. That whole thing kicked off late 1987 and all the way through 1988, which came to be dubbed in the media at the time, the second summer of love. So there's our first little clue that there may be more to this scene than uh, the Wikipedia version of events on the surface. So I wanted to revisit this whole cultural phenomenon because I remember it very well. I wasn't around in the 60s. I'm not old enough to rem remember the counterculture and to have had any part in that. But I was right there in the center of this massive acid house scene in 1988. That's when I started going out to clubs. That's when I started getting into all this music in a big way. That's when I decided I wanted to become a DJ. I mean, I ended up becoming a hip hop and black music DJ. So I wasn't really playing electronic dance music and rave stuff. But it was that whole scene that captivated me and made me realize that I wanted to have a career in music. So I've got some personal attachment to it. 
And that's the thing with all these scenes. My job is not a difficult one when I start to expose some nefarious elements of any of these cultural movements or scenes, because there's always going to be people who have that nostalgic attachment to it in the same way that are going to think you're just deliberately trying to piss on their parade and denigrate their heroes and everything that they hold dear in terms of their memories. So I get a lot of hateful vitriol from people with all these scenes that I uncover. And it's been no different with this dance music electronic uh, scene where I get a lot of grizzled old middle-aged ravers uh, dropping me emails to tell me I'm talking shit and I don't know what I'm talking about and um, I'm totally misinformed and I'm seeing stuff that isn't really there. So it's something that any researcher in this realm has to deal with, this denial, this uh, lack of acceptance that people are prepared to take on. But in the book, I've done the best job that I feel I've been able to in terms of laying out some clues and indicators and evidence, I would say, to suggest that that whole scene was, if not uh, hijacked and infiltrated from the very start, then in the very early stages of it, as it was developing, it was steered off in certain desired directions by interested parties. So we're talking various groups and various institutions. I've got to say, it's very difficult to pinpoint any documentary evidence to prove that the whole acid house scene was the product of military intelligence, uh, which is what I'm basically uh, theorizing in the book. So there aren't really any de declassified government documents that have become available. There aren't really any whistleblowers or insiders that have worked for the Tavistock Institute or MI6 or anything like that, that have come forward and said, yes, I had a key role in establishing this scene and making sure it went off in this way. So what I've been left with is piecing together all the clues and the little symbolic indicators. But I've got some former experience in doing that because I've pieced together clues and indicators in many other scenes and I'm starting to see the same patterns, the same trends, the same kind of fingerprints emerging in this whole scene. And really you've got to look at the big picture and you've got to consider what this whole scene led to. So it had its very humble beginnings in 1987-88 on a very low key level. The official Wikipedia version of the story is that there were four young London DJs, Paul Oakenfold, Danny Rampling, Nicky Holloway and Johnny Walker who went out to Ibiza on holiday and they had this kind of epiphany. They had this eureka moment when they were partying open air under the stars, amnesia, listening to all this incredible music being played by DJ Alfredo and they were on ecstasy, this new, in inverted commas, drug, which had come along at the time. And they say everything made sense to them and they had something of a spiritual awakening through the music. And they sought to bring that back to London, establish their own club nights and kick off this whole scene that came to be known as Acid House. So it was very low key beginnings, but it very quickly took a foothold in the UK. And within a few years, by the time you get to the early 90s, it had totally transformed the nightlife scene and the weekend socialising uh, rituals of hundreds of thousands of young people. That's when you add the advent of the super club. So the Ministry of Sounds and the Gate Crashes and the Creams and the Goldens and the Miss Money Pennies, all these brands had come along by that point. And all these young people were going out every single weekend, popping ecstasy pills and getting off on all this incredible new electronic music that was emerging at the time. Then you can take it all the way full circle to where we are now in 2018, 30 years on, and you look at the massive worldwide phenomenon that is electronic dance music. Look at all these massive festivals that are taking place all over the world with attendance levels of hundreds of thousands of people at a time. Then look at the imagery and the symbolism that's being portrayed by these festivals. Consider that in tandem with the large amount of drugs that are being consumed by the young people in attendance, ecstasy, but also you know other mind-altering chemical substances and then add to that the fact that the music that goes hand in hand with these events is all digital and electronic in nature and it's all to do with sound frequencies and when you consider all these elements together 
And if you accept the suggestion that there may be nefarious elements at play here, there may be certain parties that have an interest in how this scene goes off, and they don't necessarily have humanity's best interests at heart, but what they are interested in is massive social experiments using young people as lab rats to see what happens when you have a combination of these situations, then I feel it puts a very different slant on things. I think you have to look at it long term. You have to look at what electronic dance music and all these big festivals and all these big DJs and producers now are being used for, which to my mind ultimately is all about the promotion of transhumanism, the transhumanist future, the AI smart grid reality, which we're being coerced towards with every passing day. Now you start to get some idea of what the long-term plan of this whole scene may have been all along from those very humble beginnings. I know a lot of people are going to disagree with that. I know it's going to be contentious and controversial for reasons that I outlined earlier, but that's the conclusion that I've come through to through my research, and that's what I'm laying out in the first two chapters of the book. Yeah, well, so... I mean, I, everything you just said, I mean, I can completely concur with. There's a lot there. Yeah, from my own, you know, experiences, obviously. And, you know, there is a lot, you know, people, so I find that, that like, there's, most people in the dance music scene, they don't even know what transhumanism is. So they're rejecting the, like, I've brought it up to people that some of these events and parties are basically like worshiping or celebrations of transhumanism or futurism or you know the merger of man and machine kind of thing and they'll tell me I'm crazy and then I'll ask them do you know what transhumanism is and they'll say they've never heard of it right so like they're basically right. saying that I'm wrong about something that they don't even know anything about you know but you know it, it is so interesting like you know I've been remarking and sharing information about this stuff for a while and and you know even like when I've when you were on the show last time, like none of somehow like the algorithms from Facebook and whatever make it so that none of my friends from the dance music scene ever see any of this stuff that I do, right? If I post if I post some ridiculous, you know, no, nonsense picture of something that has nothing to do with anything that matters, then everybody sees it and everybody, you know, comments or likes or whatever. But it, you know, they're systematically being sort of separated from this kind of information as well. But yeah, I mean, it's, you know, so the, I don't even think that this is, I mean, you're, I'm surprised you even get that many comments from old ravers. I've had almost nobody, nobody from my dance music friends say anything about any of the stuff that I've posted or any of the things I've shared of yours or anything. No one ever says anything. So the fact that they're even engaging, I think is that's so, somewhat, you know, impressive, but yeah, I mean, um, well, to, to be honest, I'm really surprised, Emily, that no other researcher has turned this stuff up before. I don't take that to mean that I'm on the wrong track. I don't take that to mean that I've got this whole thing uh, twisted. Uh, I think there's definitely something here. And I'm very surprised that no author or researcher or filmmaker or whatever has ever looked at the dance music scene from this yeah. perspective before. Uh, I would say that a lot of people are missing something that's staring them right in the face here. I seem to be the first one that's piecing all this stuff together. I never set out to be that person, yeah. but somebody had to tell this story, you know? Nobody yeah. else is. I, I, think, I, I think that basically, I mean, I think in some ways it's the most obvious. I mean, obviously with pop music, this, it's gotten to the point of ridiculousness. But in terms of like smaller scenes, like a hip hop scene or a dance music scene, this is the scene where it's probably the most obvious. And people are, I think people are sort of afraid to, to turn over that stone. Um, and I think that it's not that other people probably haven't thought of it. I think that you're probably just the only one that's been brave enough. Because as soon as you, I mean, it's weird. Like as soon as you start talking about this stuff, energet even just energetically like there's a change and there's awareness amongst people that you're doing this right and you just like you were saying like people think you're pissing on their parade or whatever when i go to parties now i can there's even though i don't think any of the people there know what i'm doing there's like an energy that i can feel that, that is you know call it the you know the system's awareness of you once you become aware of it or whatever it is i think that really scares people and i think it's not that other people haven't uh, had this moment of consideration, I think you've just been the only one brave enough to do it. Well, I mentioned earlier that I've not had any whistleblowers come forward in terms of saying they work for military intelligence or whatever. But what I have had since I've started putting this work out is correspondence from a whole load of former ravers 
Mm -hmm. uh, I get emails every day now from people yeah. saying, I've looked at your work and definitely you're onto something. You're on the right track. I used to go to these parties. I used to go to these festivals and I got the feeling there was something strange going on in the atmosphere. You know, these people say, I used to do mind altering drugs and I felt that in some way this was interacting with the sound frequencies of the music. And you also had all this subliminal imagery being flashed into your mind mm -hmm. in terms of the visuals that you get at these events. And people have said, it didn't feel right. It didn't sit well with me. And, you know, I had to remove myself from those situations. I think you made a, a similar comment yourself when we spoke for my Good Vibrations podcast. But I get comments like this all the time. And in the book, in the second chapter, I think, I quote a whole load of former ravers that popped up on a David Icke forum discussion. Yeah doesn't matter what anyone thinks of David Icke, that's completely irrelevant here. I'm just mentioning the fact that his forum was the platform for a whole load of people to start this discussion among themselves. And they're all sharing their experiences. And you've got guys in Australia saying, I went to dance festivals in Australia, and I felt that the visuals, the subliminals were interacting with me in some undesirable way and then some dude in california will pop up saying yeah yeah the same thing happened to me man and then you'll get some guy in birmingham in england saying the same thing mm -hmm. so this has definitely been an international agenda yeah. and again i would just urge people to consider how big and how far reaching and influential this whole scene has become electronic dance music is popular with young people because it's always the younger generation that are in the targets of the social engineers, those that want to mind control large numbers of people. They always go after the younger generation. They don't bother with people of my generation because as far as they're concerned, we're done. We're finished. We don't matter. They just want the minds and the hearts and the souls of young people. They're much more malleable, much more able to be manipulated. So this whole scene is aimed at young people and you have dance festivals in pretty much every country in the world. There are very few countries now where you won't find nightclubs and big events pushing electronic dance music in its contemporary form. So really, can any scene, any cultural movement that affects that large number of people be considered to have evolved organically? Given what we know about organizations and institutions like the Tavistock Institute, MI5, MI6, the CIA, the Esalen Institute, Yale and Harvard, Oxford and Cambridge Universities, SRI, MIT, all these others, that specialize in changing culture and shaping values. The Frankfurt School would be another one. Yep. Who really believes that a scene this big would have been allowed to just get there under its own steam without some kind of meddling or infiltration from these kind of organizations? To me, it's obvious that this has gone on. I've done a lot of research into how culture creation works, what lifetime actors are, and you find them in every walk of life. They're there in the world of politics. They're there in the world of banking and finance, big business, the military, the world of science, the world of academia. So, of course, they're going to be there in the world of entertainment, in Hollywood movies and in the music industry. And like I say, with electronic dance music, you've got, well, it's not hundreds of thousands. It's actually millions, millions of people around the world being captivated by all this stuff. Of course, at some point along the way, there's going to be measures that have been taken to ensure this scene serves certain agendas and that's what we're talking about here again a great amount of denial from large numbers of people who just don't want to accept that something they hold so dear to themselves that they consider to be so pure and so natural and so good and has enhanced their life in such a major way could be a little more than what they thought it was but as with all things the truth is the truth hey i've been fooled i've been duped i've been made a mug of a hundred times in my life. And with every passing month, it seems I find a new way in which I've been made a mug of. And my reaction to that is, I'm not happy about it. And I don't want it to happen again. So I want to discover the methods that were used. Yeah. That's just me, you know, people differ, but that's my stance on it. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's, that's very clear. And, and I, I, I agree. And I think a lot of people, part of the reason that they're afraid of the truth is then they think, feel like it's going to mean that their experiences like didn't matter, right? Because you've been made a mug of, your experiences didn't matter. And I beg to differ because those experiences- We learn from these things. We learn from, we them. Grow from them. Yeah. But also there is, you know, the re if, if, if this, and in this case, dance music, if it was just something stupid that didn't have the power to be effective, they wouldn't bother with it. They've bothered with it and bothered to manipulate it because they know it has power and can be effective. And so if people can become 
aware of what's good. You know, awareness is the biggest, most important part of all of this. If people can become aware and start to wrestle back some of the control of this, get, you know, start retaining control over their, you know, musical decisions, start retaining control over their events, really understand and know the people they're working with and what their intentions are, then this can be used for something that can be truly beneficial and, you know, and, and whatnot. Like they don't, they wouldn't waste their time turning something that was meaningless into a weapon. You know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's, there, there is something there that if we can um, grow up and take, you know, back control of our own minds in relationship to it can be used for the thing that we thought it was in the beginning, but we were fooled. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, absolutely. My mind goes back to some comments that I've heard that were made by Gregory Bateson who was one of the founding members of the OSS, which became the CIA. He was the husband of Margaret Mead, who was another uh, social engineer, basically, anthropologist. And he talked in the very early days of establishing the CIA of wanting to create what was described as an archaic revival. This has come to light in documentation in recent years, which has come forward, private correspondence between Bateson and some of his associates. And this, uh, the, the idea of the archaic revival was harking back to previous civilizations where the people would be coerced into embracing their primal instincts, their primal uh, base desires. And it would be all about uh, music, ritualistic dance, and mind-altering drugs. And it seems that this combination has been rolled out in society countless times in different parts of the world over the centuries. And Bateson was talking about what we need is a new archaic revival. And that eventually became the 60s counterculture and, and the way that whole thing was packaged, where you had the psychedelic rock going hand in hand with the LSD and all the other drugs that were around at the time and all the dancing and all the partying and stuff. And, you know, as, as so many researchers have shown, that whole 60s hippie counterculture scene, at least in part, helped to keep large numbers of young people away from any kind of political activism at that very key point in the 1960s, when there were all these major social changes going on in the US and further afield. You had the Vietnam War, all these other major things happening. And it seems a large number of people who might otherwise have taken an active kind of role in all of that were instead encouraged to embrace these primal desires and undergo this kind of archaic revival that he spoke about. So to my mind, what we had with the 80s acid house scene was just another rebooting and repackaging of that, that whole scenario for a new generation in a different part of the world. So you had the ritualistic dance with all the, uh, the dance routines that went with the acid house scene from those very early days. You had uh, a lot of symbology and icons and motifs that were used. The smiley yellow face that springs to mind straight away yeah. as an instantly recognizable motif of that whole acid house scene. Then you had the ecstasy, the E or MDMA, not Molly, as uh, you know it's known these days, coming along hand in hand with that as well. And that whole scene was all about large numbers of people dropping out from society, forgetting about the oppressive Thatcher regime that we had in the UK at the time. It was a, a time of great austerity. It was a time of uh, you know, the conservative government that had been in place for far too many years, having a stranglehold on uh, society. And Britain was a pretty grim place at the time. And the acid house scene served as a form of escapism for large numbers of people. So to my mind, this whole template has been used many times before. And the social engineers behind it know what they're doing with it. And they know where they want to take things. And they're very adept at rolling it out to different generations and making it feel like it's something personal for those people that yeah. are involved. They feel like it's their scene. It's something that speaks to them individually. Certainly, that's how I felt about it. Back in 1988, when I was going out partying and this new music had come along, I felt like it was something fresh. It was something new. It was sticking two fingers up at the establishment. But, you know, with the benefit of maturity and hindsight and the ability to do the research that we now have with the Internet, uh, you come to discover that many scenes that appear to be sticking two fingers up at the establishment <coughs> are, in fact, controlled by a of the establishment it's a limited hangout and uh you know it's controlled every step of the way let me interject something here because every generation thinks that what is being brought out in the generation is new and unique and that the technology is novel and new so 
this is part of the research that I did years ago. If you go back to 1627 and Francis Bacon and the New Atlantis, you're going to find out that this was all envisioned in that era. And I want to just read this real brief quote here. It says, this is from the New Atlantis, Francis Bacon. It says, we also have sound houses where we practice and demonstrate all sounds in their generation. We have harmonies which you have not of quarter sounds and lesser sounds of sounds, diverse instruments of music likewise to you unknown, some sweeter than any you have, have altogether with bells and rings and dainty and sweet. We represent small sounds as great and deep, likewise great sounds extenuate and sharp. We make diverse tremblings and warblings of sound. What's described by Francis Bacon here is nothing less than the inside of a disco. In 1627, this was not lost on the architects who uh, uh, basically used this as a blueprint when they launched out the plans from Tavistock. Yeah, it, I mean, to me, this is what, the, I mean, it is the sacred geometry of space, time, yeah. and sound. That's what he is describing there. And just, I want to roll back for a second to something you were saying, Mark, and that, you know, I'm, you were talking about Greg, Gregory Bateson and the archaic revival, but in this country and in, in the early days of some of the Raven underground party scene, Terrence McKenna used to speak at raves, as you know this, and he would talk about the archaic revival. And, you know, I have sort of a mixed set of feelings on Terrence McKenna. I know that, you know, Jan Irvin obviously has this idea that he fully, completely thinks that, you know, Terrence McKenna was completely working for agencies. And I think Greg Terrence McKenna may have gotten caught up in something that wasn't his intention. You know what I mean? Like, I think he may have, you know, sort of inadvertently become the front man for something and, you know, it was probably suckered into something he didn't want to be doing. I don't think he was an evil guy, but he, I have many friends that talk about for when they first started going to raves in the early nineties or whatever, um, that being at raves where Terrence McKenna would be there giving a talk before the rave would start. Right. And so, and he would talk about this whole thing with the archaic revival and what you were saying about how, Back in the 60s, these kinds of this movement derailed people from being politically active and then sort of the same thing in the, in the acid house, the early acid house scene. Well, I'd say in a lot of ways, the same thing is, goes on right here, right? Like there are parties, multiple, multiple, I mean, there's the huge big festivals and I don't even really pay attention to what goes on there at all anymore. But even with these smaller underground things that are more like what I like to do, there's seven, 10, 12 of them here in Los Angeles every weekend, different varieties of electronic music. And there's some people, there's, I, there's lots of people that I know from parties that are my age, you know, in their late 30s or early 40s or whatever, I'm 42, that go out every weekend, sometimes to multiple events for the, on the weekend, and they're doing this all the time. Meanwhile, they have no idea what's going on in the world. Like at this point, I hardly ever get to go out. I go out maybe four or five times a year now. And even I'd like to go out more than that, but you know, I'm usually like, I, I can't, I have something I have to do in the morning. I'm you know, recording this show. I'm busy researching this, that, or the other thing and trying to understand what's going on in reality. So just like in the sixties that it was keeping them from political activism, you know, I'm not sure how much use there is in political activism these days, but there is a lot of use in being aware of what's going on in the world. Awareness, and, exactly. Yeah. And these people have no idea. They're just, they, they go to these things. They think they're counterculture because they do that. And because they, you know, maybe dress different or funny or whatever. But at the end of the day, they all worship authority. They all vote for Hillary Clinton. They all, you know, believe everything that CNN says. They all think that, you know, the story was just like it said about the shooting. They all think that there's Russian collusion, you know, I mean, and ultimately they're all, you know, singing the mantra that I- Watch it, you're going to get us banned again. <laughs> they're ultimately all, <laughs> you know, literally, like I saw this meme a couple of weeks ago and it completely <laughs> describes where we're at. And it says, anyone I disagree with is a Russian bot. And that's kind of like, uh, you know, all these people, they don't actually know anything that's going on, but they've heard this whole thing about Russian collusion and, and about that, you know, the people, some people think that, um, you know, these uh, shootings and stuff aren't real or whatever. So they just go with the prescribed opinion on CNN, even though they, th I mean, I just don't understand how you think you're counterculture and you stay up all night dancing to music and then you're like, Hillary Clinton, let's vote for the Democrats. Like, I just, you know what I mean? Like, I just, it's so... Um, the awareness is the new is like right now it's about awareness. It's a fair and balanced go vote for trump and think uh, that's right. a liberation so, movement or, right you know but they, but, but they but they don't the people people in the underground dance music scene there's like a few people i've ever met that are like right. you know libertarian right. I get that. Or it's a demographic 
they think they they actually think that it's like uh that being to the left is being rebellious and i'm just like it's just so not anymore at all like you know, so, and you, know you know what the thing about that is i speak to so many people that will say the same thing as you so you're in california right and you're yeah. talking about the attitude of people that you come into contact with at these events so uh I listen to a lot of Mark Pastio's output and recently he's been bemoaning the spiritual state of people in Philadelphia, his home city. Right. So he's talking about the, the general consciousness of people in Philadelphia, he says, is, a, is at an all time low. And he's disgusted and ashamed that this was the city where the American Revolution basically kicked off from. And here we are in 2018 and people are in this golemized state of absolute base consciousness. But I can speak to somebody in London that will say exactly the same thing. Then I could speak to a friend in Copenhagen or Stockholm or Prague or anywhere you might care to mention in Europe. And they'll all say, oh, I don't know what it is about people in Copenhagen, but they're in such a low state of consciousness. Then you could speak to somebody in Sydney, Australia, and they'll say the same thing. So you come to realize it's not your city. Right. It's not your region. It's not your country. This is the state that the whole world is in which again, hints at international agendas to keep people's consciousness locked down. Uh, and that's what we're dealing with here. And you said uh, there's a very low level of awareness among ravers at these events that you go to, towards what's happening in the world. And I think the biggest area of ignorance occurs in the most dangerous area of society in terms of where things are being led, which is that aforementioned fast push towards transhumanism. I mean, I get on my hobby horse about transhumanism and the smart grid futurist AI uh, agenda quite a lot, because as far as I'm concerned, this is the, the, the major threat facing humanity right now. In my, to my mind, this is the new world order. This is what it all comes down to in terms of where society is headed very quickly. And when it comes to these electronic dance music events, I just want to highlight the names and the themes and the overall symbology of a few, yeah. which provides absolute proof that this scene is being used to subliminally normalize these ideas in the minds of these young people. Again, as we said, a lot of them going to these events will be under the influence of mind-altering uh, uh, chemicals. And this is happening in tandem with all this subliminal stuff being flashed into their minds in terms of cell frequencies and visuals. But I just want to pick out a DJ producer by the name of Paul Van Dyke, this, this German DJ producer. I know you and I have had some correspondence about this guy, Emily, and it might, feel, it might seem like I'm being unfair in singling him out, but I'm just being a researcher and I'm using him as a great example of what key players in this scene are being used for. So I just want to mention a few events that he's been involved with over the course of the past couple of years, which I detail in the book. Uh, so he's been a headliner at events including Dream State in California, Trance Nation and Luminosity in the Netherlands, Velvet Hypnotized in Bali, Atlantis in Australia, Spring Awakening in Chicago, Awake in Dresden, Awakening Fridays in LA, Dream Beach in Spain, Delirium Eternity in Argentina, then you've got Tomorrow World in Atlanta, Tomorrow Land in Belgium, Future Music Festival in Australia, and New Horizons in Jakarta. So all of these events conjure up images of the futurist society that we're all being pushed towards. It's all to do with uh, digital electronic realities. Mm -hmm. That's there in the names of many of these events, digital dreams and all the right. rest of it. Right there. And all, yeah. all these events go by these names. This cannot be coincidence. And it cannot be down to a couple of promoters seeing what their peers are doing and thinking, oh, that's a good idea. We'll have one called Awakening as well. We'll have one called Tomorrowland. This is all clearly a coordinated agenda. All these events are massive. They're staged on a corporate level. It's not just, you know, a, a few chances uh, trying their hand at promoting here. It's very big companies. And many of these brands come from the same... Uh, stable, you know, the same overall companies. There's one called SFX Entertainment, which I know you put me on to, yeah. uh, who stage many of these events. And then you get guys like Paul Van Dyke and Tiesto and Avicii and Armin Van Buren and Steve Aoki and guys like that, who always crop up as the headliners at these events. So these are the chosen ones. These are the tried and tested Pied Pipers of this scene that are wheeled out to be the public face of them. And they're the ones that you see topping the bill at all these events, 
all of which are pushing transhumanism and normalizing that whole idea. And as you said, many of the ravers that goes to the, uh, go to these events seem to be missing the elephant in the room, the thing that is so bloody obvious that that's what these events are all about. Right. They are so caught up in having a good time and they're so delirious and euphoric on the vibe of these events that they can't see what's bashing them around the head with a baseball bat saying, look at me, look at me. You yeah. know, talk about something so obvious being missed. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think, you know, the kinds of things that Paul Van Dyke and Tiesto, they play at these huge, massive festivals. And, you know, I notice that, like, when people are first sort of getting into dance music or moving into that, whatever that level of consciousness associated with that is, they tend to be really into those kinds of DJs. You know what I mean? And some people stay there forever. You know what I mean? And, you know, there's exactly what you're talking about going on there. There's this whole, you know, there's all this symbolism being flashed. There's the music itself in a lot of ways and the kind of ways that it's produced is a celebration of a symbiotic relationship between man and machine. You know what I mean? It's, it, it, it's almost in the way you have, like, you know, stages and DJs set up. It's almost like, you know, worship at the altar of the, of the merger of, 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 you know, humanity and technology kind of thing. Um, there's that level of it. And then there's this more underground level that, 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 that to me has like an even, I mean, I think the ideas for how they're going to do that, the, 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 the obvious goal is, you know, the mind controlling of the masses. And I think that they play around with stuff kind of like if you go back and look at, you know, Laurel Canyon and Dave McGowan's work, like a lot of the really super weird stuff was not happening with the most famous of the groups. It was happening with the smaller, less well-known groups, but that had sort of a cult-like following, right? And so I, that's how I see it with the underground. And, and you know, there's an underground in many other cities, not just Los Angeles, but I think Los Angeles just has probably one of the most interesting and biggest ones at this point. And you know, I think this is where like more of your um, experimentation with psychotronic weaponry and e even elements of black magic and you have people who are sort of um you know maybe more aware of occult and this kind of stuff uh, that's where this energy is really played with and harnessed and then once they've decided what they want to do with it they go and they sort of you know push it out at these big massive festivals where none of the people at the big massive festivals you don't have any people with any kind of awareness of anything like that right they're just there thinking they're having a good time they're dancing around they're taking their ecstasy and twirling their lights and whatever and they have no idea like what they're being indoctrinated with i don't think that there's such that level of of um innocence or naivety in the underground but there is this complete i mean it, it seems like there wouldn't be but i am constantly shocked at how much um people even in the underground don't actually know about any of this stuff you know what i right. mean they, like there is like um obviously like a better taste in music like you know if you came if you listen if you went to one of these big paul van dyke things and then you went to something that i that i go to you obviously recognize that the music is much better and and whatever what i'm doing that you know like i sometimes i was telling this to uh i can't remember if i was telling this to james bartley or to michael joseph but sometimes when i'm at parties i'll just like chat somebody up the last party that i was at was a party by a production company called, called Droid Behavior. So already the nod to it, right, in the name. And they're, and they're very, very proficient with the use of all the different kinds of technology with music. And they're quite, quite amazing with it. But I'll just sometimes, just for shits and giggles, start asking people, like, I'll take a poll, I'll go up to talk to someone I know, and be like, hey, do you know what transhumanism is? And they'll be like, no, what is it? <laughs> you know, right? So like, I, and I'll explain it to them. And I'll be like, you know, kind of like this. <laughs> and they look at me like, they just have no idea what I'm talking about, right? See, that's, that's incredible to me. It's incredible that people have missed this. Well, especially when they're, they're sitting, like everything that they like is a complete celebration of it and they've never heard of it. So, and Particularly like, people of a certain age. I mean, if you're in your 20s, you've right. not really known anything other in your adult life than the type of society we have now with this complete reliance on technology. But if you're 40 plus, I imagine yeah. that a lot, of the, a lot of the people that go to the parties you attend yeah. would be, you know, they're in their age. 40s. They're our age, so, yeah. Right, so they're old enough to remember 20 years ago when society was very different, when everything wasn't run by computers, 
when uh, you didn't have an app for every goddamn thing you want to do in your life. So they've seen that change in society and they still put it down to a series of random occurrences and not an agenda. It, well, it's weird because you have plenty of people that like remember the old school, and so there's even a lot of there's a lot of DJs, and obviously, and even a lot of you know just uh, fans and listeners that some appreciate vinyl records as opposed to you know all this you know digital stuff, but they haven't looked any farther. They haven't go, gone to the next logical step as why to why why is this happening, right? So they might say, oh, I liked it better when everybody just played regular records. But then when I say, well, this is part, you know, if I, well, this is part of sort of the push towards, you know, merging man and machine towards a transhumanist future, right? Right? And they'll look at me like, what? Like, I think a lot of people, like, yeah, why would they do that? Th- their, consp- their conspiratorial mind will only go as far as, well, if they're doing it, it must be for financial reasons. Like, they're, like, you know what I mean? And that, that becomes the big excuse for everything, right? Like, everybody always thinks that, you know, uh, the, um, oh, the, the mind control that's practiced in uh, pop culture is just subliminal stuff to get people to buy shit. And I always felt like that's obviously I the hear cover, that, yeah. right? The cover for, you know, like it, it, the, the real controllers, the people who are, you know, the people who run Tavistock Institute, they don't really care about money. They care about control, but they're perfectly happy to employ a bunch of people who care about money, to, you know, to agents and dis- different things, middleman kinds of creatures to make everything seem sort of to the public like it's really about that. You know, those kinds of idiots, the middlemen who are sort of obsessed with image and obsessed with money are the perfect tools to get the task of the tyrants done because the tyrants have something else in mind. You know, but I mean, it's amazing to me. So that, that's as far as it, 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 I notice people's conspiratorial mind go. I also have noticed that like in the underground scene you have, so I find it interesting, like a lot of what you talk about in your book and, and what you've been talking about in some of your, your talks and stuff the last couple of years is about lifetime actors. And obviously like in the dance music scene, we've brought up that you have someone like Pete Tong, who's the most obvious lifetime actor. But I think that in the dance music scene is unique from some of these other things and that it isn't so much about celebrity as some of these other musical genres. And so I think you have a whole different kind of lifetime actor and not all of them are necessarily the big front man kind of people. I wonder if, you know, when I was reading your book, I really started thinking about this. You know, you talk about looking, there hasn't been a whistleblower from Tavistock or MI6 or anything like that. But what I'm- Well, yet. (laughs) Yet, yet. But, but, okay. But I'm wondering if there aren't really many, many, many more people like me in the scene than than we know, because they're not even aware of themselves, right? And one of the things that I'm further and further finding is that, you know, you know, I think I shared with you like some of the information I'd found from when my mother worked for a company related to Tavistock called Psycon, right? She worked on this really interesting study about, and she doesn't have any memory of this, which is really interesting, but I have these papers that I found when I moved at my, when I packed at my dad's house and moved it, where she was working on writing papers on certain kinds of drug dependency, including some of the kinds of drugs that are used at parties. She was writing this back in the 70s in London, when she lived in London, and she was working at a company called Psycon, right, which is in Tavistock Square, and, and she, you know, was, it was in 1973 or 74, my right father, in the belly of the beast. Right in the belly of the beast. And my father was attending University of London School of African and Oriental Studies, which has you know, all sorts of strange connections to funny stuff. So they were there for that reason. My mother's memory was that she was working. My mother was a financial analyst for an oil company for most of my life here. Um, but this was before that. And her memory of what she was doing when she was in London was working on uh, some sort of oil project for a town in Iraq. But I I found some papers about that, but I also found all these other papers about drug dependency and all sorts of really, you know, interesting tests about how you, like, you know, if you could tell when they would test lab lab rats, you could see that there was permanent changes in the brain from using LSD and this, that, and the other, you know, all sorts of really interesting stuff. And, you know, then I end up here in this scene liking this music. You know, is it like, I've had, I've had, you know, feeling before when I go to some events that like, 
It's just certain kinds of really smaller parties that I go to. In some ways, it's a reunion for people like me, people who've been through some aspect of mind control programs and experiences and have family backgrounds like me. And I would really be interested to know the backgrounds of some of these people and their parents. I know that there's a lot of people who go to parties who they're, and even some of the DJs in the scene who aren't full-time DJ, full-time working in that, who they work for companies like Northrop Grumman, they work for Raytheon, or they work for some of the companies that make these technological musical instruments like Native Instruments and you know uh, Ableton and Tractor and, and, and stuff like that. They do that. And a lot of them are also like very interested in things like SpaceX. Like they really believe in Elon Musk and all of this kind of crap like that. Like it just, it, it, it dawned, like I just wonder how many more people there really are like, like, like me in this scene. I also, um, mm. I know you're a big fan of Greg's and I was listening to a show, I don't know if you ever heard this show he did with Janice Barcelo and she was talking about um, ultrasound damaging uh, the, like the, basically the mind. Oh yeah, and birth just, trauma. Yeah. Birth trauma, right? And he talked about her new book and we, Randy interviewed her several years back. We're going to have to have her back and I want to get into, I always like to take people down a different rabbit hole than they thought we were going to go down. But he, he mentioned that she's working on a new book called MK Ultrasound. Okay, and I'm wondering if some of this like brain birth trauma from the ultrasound is somehow connected to people liking dance music and like that kind of repetitive beat. I mean, when you when I first started going to raves, you would see people like they would be curled up in the stereo cabinets, like right? They would be like almost like asleep inside the speaker, like they were trying to like hear the sound of like the heartbeat or the mother's womb kind of thing. And I just wonder, I and mean, it 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 wouldn't surprise me, especially with companies like, with groups like Tavistock, that they would, it would be that sinister and that evil, that we would damage kids' brain from the time that they were in the womb, right? That we would damage their brain and their physiology, and then we would continue that trauma throughout their life with some of this music. Now, I'm not saying that the music in and of itself is bad. Obviously not. I love it. But some of the crap that's the most popular crap and some of the shit that can happen to you if you don't have a level of awareness sounds almost exactly like what she's talking about with the pre-birth trauma and the ultrasound machine. What do you think about some of that? Well, you raise some very good points there, and none of that would surprise me. Very little does anymore. There's a lady by the name of Kathy Morgan. I don't know if you've heard of her, but she's English. She lives in Ireland. But she gave a great presentation at an event called AwakeCon in England in November, which I attended. And um, I gave this talk to my dad to listen to last night, actually, because... Uh, He's very interested in these subjects, and I think there could be some personal connection there as well. She states that she was the subject of MK Ultra style mind control programming in the UK. And in fact, there is a very far reaching arm of that whole research, if you want to call it that, which has always been there in England. So we hear about the stuff that the CIA did all over the US from the 1950s onwards, but she states it's been mirrored in the UK and that many people from childhood, herself included, that come from military families. So there's this military connection again. Her father was very heavily connected to the military and she was one of twins. And we know that military intelligence loves doing experimentation on twins, all kinds of consciousness experiments. So she states that from a very early age, from as far back as she can remember, she was moved around from place to place and experimented upon as part of this UK program. And there are many researchers that think the whole MK Ultra uh, phenomenon actually emerged out of the UK and was exported to the, UK, uh, the US uh, via characters like Aldous Huxley, who seems to have been one of the architects of MK Ultra and is part of the British establishment through, you know, the Huxley family. But anyway, Kathy Morgan... Uh, also spoke of some of these early UK festivals, music festivals. So she mentioned the Isle of Wight Festival, which kicked off in, I think it was 1968. Then you had the Windsor Festival and Glastonbury, and Glastonbury first emerged in 1970. And she said she can remember attending some of these festivals in the early 70s, when she was still very young, just a teenager, but she was seemingly coerced into attending these things. And she's of the view that 
at least on one level, these acted as experiments in uh, communal uh, living conditions. And they were also used for surveillance of subjects such as herself to see what would happen when they were all brought together in a similar environment with music present and with imagery and symbolism present. And they were being treated as experimental lab rats that were being uh, observed the whole time. Yeah. and notes were being made on them. So she's got some very interesting comments about that. Also, what's very interesting to me is the different reactions that you get from people experiencing the same situations. So when it comes to the rave era in the UK and these very early parties, a lot of people have come forward in recent years to state that they got hooked on ecstasy or LSD or whatever else it was at these events and they had some really bad experiences on them. It's fried their brains, they say. Uh, they've experienced things like psychosis and bipolar disorder and dissociative identity disorder as a result of taking too many of these drugs and they're full of regret for the fact that they did it. And you can now see them on chat forums and having discussions with each other saying, yeah, I've screwed my life up with this stuff. But for every individual that you find with a story like that, you'll find somebody else full of nothing but praise for psychoactive uh, compounds. And they will say, oh, doing acid changed my life in such a major way. It opened me up to new levels of consciousness. I started reading books by David Icke that I would never formally have gone close to. And I've now got this expanded experience of reality that would never otherwise have been the case. It's turned my life around. And it seems that people react to mind-altering drugs and also the circumstances uh, and the, the surroundings in which they're delivered in different ways. You can also equate that to people that try to follow certain diets. And we could talk about a vegan diet because I'm a vegan myself and it's worked out just fine for me. But I know there's a lot of people that have tried to go from meat eating either directly to a vegan diet or via a vegetarian diet as a transitory thing. And they've had terrible experiences. I mean, Jan Irving goes on about this all the time. He'll tell you about this, how yeah. he got very ill pursuing a vegan diet. And it seems that some people's biological makeup is just not equipped to be able to go from meat eating to a vegan diet. It's pretty devastating for them. Whereas somebody else can do it in one uh, bout and be absolutely fine with it, as many other people have attested. So we seem to have different psychological and physiological reactions to uh, compounds and to uh, influences and even to subliminals, it just seems to affect people in different ways. I don't know if that's down to the life path that people are following, if we want to take it that deep and that spiritual and consider the idea that we're all undergoing certain experiences that we have consented to and agreed to in some way before we incarnated into this reality. You know, that's a very deep place to take it. But for whatever reason, uh, one man can react very differently to a combination of drugs and sound frequencies to the next man or woman, which is very interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, you just said a bunch of interesting stuff there. I'll ask you to please send me that talk from Kathy Morgan, because what you just said sure. is, is she's talking about an earlier version of exactly what I think. Like, I, I, I feel like I'm almost to the point now where I feel like the, um, that's a lot of what this party scene is for is to call together certain people who they know have certain kinds of backgrounds and certain kinds of experiences. Right, right. So they've been traced and tracked. They know who and where they are and they're bringing them together. Yeah. I mean, like my, the, my friend, Chris Taylor, who's an energy healer says, well, you want people, you want to bring, get certain people to go to a certain place. How do you do that? You make a party there, right. That you know that they would like, and, you know, and see, you know, we were talking about some of the parties being held on certain ley lines or in certain specific buildings where, or, you know, where there is, you know, maybe some sort of like thin, thinner sort of ether, sort of like a portal or like a vortex where certain kinds of energies can come in and all of that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, no, I mean, I think that, you know, when I, like I now, so it was very interesting, this party that I went to back in November that I was talking a little bit about before. Um, it's this group who they're very well known for creating basically the LA underground techno warehouse scene, but they decided to do for their 15th anniversary a tribute to Acid House, right? And so they had um, DJ Deep and Steve Bicknell from 
uh, London from, you know, who are a little bit more of the underground of the acid house scene than some of the ones that you were, that you were talking about. And it was a great party. The music was wonderful and whatever, but with what I know, with all of the things that I know, and people, people would absolutely laugh if they knew what was going through my mind at these parties. Now I'm not having in any way the similar kind of experience that anybody else there is having. But to me, you can just see that there is this pipeline that's been created through Tavistock Institute that connects London to Los Angeles, right? You can even see it in my own life. My parents are from here. They went to UCLA. They went off to London and did all this work. My father got involved in what he got involved in. My mom got involved in what she got involved in. And then they came back right back here before they had me. And I have all of this strange compound of life experiences and whatever. I can't be the only one there who has this. I might be the only one there who's aware of it. But, it, you know, it, it, I mean, what if the, I don't think this is true for the whole massive rave scene, but with the underground party scene, I think it's entirely possible that upwards of 50% of the people there are there for the purpose that Kathy, Mor that you say Kathy Morgan described. And they don't even Absolutely. know that we're being like, you know, called back to the, I mean, I went to this one party where I just felt like, oh, this is interesting. I feel this feels to me like a reunion of a bunch of mind controlled assets. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, and just to see what happens when we all get exposed to each other. If you put these people, not just to surveil and see how they respond to the music, but also what happens when you put them around each other. Right. Yeah. yeah. Let me just share a little anecdote with you here. I've never shared this publicly before, but it seems the right moment to do it. And it concerns my dad, who I mentioned earlier. You know, I've mentioned my dad in previous interviews. He's a heavy guy. He's a deep thinking guy. He reads a lot. He's the one that kind of got me into this type of research because he taught me to uh, realize that it's okay to be different many years ago. It's okay to stray from the crowd. It's okay to think for yourself. That's the kind of mindset that he instilled in me. So if it hadn't been for him, I probably wouldn't be doing this, this kind of research. And this story relates to him. I don't think he'd mind me telling it. We were talking about it just last night, actually. So it's quite synchronistic. But I mentioned this Kathy Morgan presentation to him, and I recommended that he watch it. So I gave him the YouTube link because she talked of believing that from a very early age, she was inducted into some kind of surveillance program and she was selected for it. And that it's been with her all her life. And I can remember my dad many, many years ago telling me that he had these memories from a very young age of being in some kind of hospital type institution environment. And there were all these doctors in white coats that he can remember just fussing over him and messing about with him. You know, we're talking probably the age of three or four. And my dad was adopted, so, you know, his early life is, is a bit of a mess. But he has got these memories of these doctors, whatever they were, in white coats. And he's also got this memory of something he thinks being implanted into his ear. And he's always felt as if there's something inside his head that is not natural, that shouldn't be there. He can't be any more specific about it than that. But Kathy Morgan has spoken about something similar, about an implant in her ear. And she believes that this has been used to kind of track and trace and surveil her through all her life. And this was quite mind-blowing to hear my dad talking about this, because I'm thinking, my God, you know, my dad's not just some ordinary dude. And why am I now doing this kind of work, yeah, yeah, revealing wow. all this kind of stuff? You know, nothing is happening here by accident. No, that's so, nothing. Uh, that's, that's just an interesting story that I wanted to share for the first time. Well, it's, it, it's not surprising yeah. you say that. I mean, I I've, think I've said on the show before, I think I have some kind of speaker inside of my ear. Like, I can hear it turn I on. I remember you mentioning it, yeah. Yeah, and so, like, I, 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 you know, and I feel like the same, like, there's part of me that feels like, Maybe like we're here, like somehow our future selves planned it for us, planned for you to be here having the life you're having and me and me to be having the one I'm having for us to be here right now talking about this. You know, like we had to go through this to remember what happened. And, you know, like it's not this. Isn't that really what, aren't <laughs> they really trying to simulate what's organically occurring as we connect with each other? They're aggregating what they consider to be a, a body of test subjects to demonstrate their technology on while at the same time synchronistically and quite organically people in this movement people in the underground people in the alternative media streams are also coming together to compare notes and 
and share stories. And, and it's so it feels to me like there's, there's two sides to this. And one is a convergence of people that's designed artificially and scientifically to test and basically sort different types of people with different mindsets, metabolisms, whatever, while at the same time, we're coming together in, in this way and beginning to find out that there's all these overlaps and similarities. Right. Let me just throw a couple of additional things into the mix here, which are slightly related. It's a bit random, but one other thing I wanted to mention is there was a researcher by the name of Max Spears, who people mm -hmm. might be aware of. Uh, he passed away a couple of years ago in very suspicious circumstances in Poland. Uh, very interesting guy. He's seemingly the subject of mind control experimentation himself, and he comes from a military family. Uh, but I heard an interview with him many years ago where he was talking about the NHS, the National Health Service in Britain. And he was of the view that this was set up for the purpose of tracking and tracing certain individuals and the authorities knowing where they are in the world. So the NHS is ostensibly a free health service available to all citizens of the United Kingdom. So whereas in America, if you get ill, you have to go and pay for a doctor or pay for treatment, the idea is that in the UK, a large amount of the treatment you will need is provided by the state. But a big part of putting that together was to compile a database of everyone in the country and to have all kinds of biometric data about them, details of their DNA, and then all kinds of details of family background and ancestry and all of that, and keeping a continual check on where they are in the world. And Max Spears was of the view that this was set up to help trace people of certain bloodlines and certain families and to know where they are in the world because as anyone that's done more than five minutes research into this whole realm will know, so much of it is down to ancestral bloodlines and genealogy and the families that many of these key players come from. The other thing I just wanted to throw into the conversation is my research just recently in the closing stages of putting this book together uh, brought me to The Loft, David Mancuso, yeah. which was this very seminal uh, aspect. Yeah. Yeah, to the in New, New York. York party scene. Yeah. So this guy, David Mancuso, ran a venue known as The Loft, which was actually his home. It was a converted loft mm -hmm. apartment in I, Broadway. I, yeah. I've been, to, I, I've been to something that is like the revival of that when I lived in New York. Like it was, it was you know, Dave Mancuso, was, it, his, his scene was much earlier, but they still have events in that space. Right. So yeah. there were different venues known as The Loft, but it was always Mancuso's home and it was always in Lower Manhattan. And the first parties that he staged kicked off on Valentine's Day, 1970. And they were known as Love Saves the Day. What do those initials spell out? Can't quite think. But anyway, uh, the idea behind these parties... <laughs> yeah. The, the idea behind these parties was that they were invitation only. So you couldn't just roll up and attend like you do in a nightclub. Uh, Mancuso selected who he wanted at these parties. And it was all about music, which was played on uh, state-of-the-art equipment. So it was for audiophiles, people that really appreciate the technology of music. So it was the best possible sound systems. And the music was played. It wasn't mixed. It was just listening to track after track that would be selected by Mancuso and others. And it would be a gathering of a, a select group of people. And I always swallowed the official version of that, which was that kind of led to venues like the Paradise Garage and Studio 54 and all these other iconic New York venues. That whole thing kicked off with the loft and it instilled this idea in people's minds of getting together in this communal space and listening to all this great music. That's what kicked off the New York nightlife scene. But some research that I've seen recently has suggested that these early loft parties were more about these experimental type situations where people would be surveilled under certain circumstances and they would be observed when they were doing certain drugs because for sure drugs were happening at these parties and certain types of music was being played and it all seems to tie into things like temporal autonomous zones which yeah. is this idea of communal living uh, what happens when large numbers of people or small numbers of people, I guess, get together in certain circumstances in, in a highly controlled environment 
and the results are then observed. So the loft parties would appear to be a little bit more than just this random guy having a few friends around his house and playing some great music. And of course, they did lead to the instigation of the New York party scene as we know it. There's a couple of great books by an author called Tim Lawrence, which document the official version of how this whole thing got started. But there seems to be more about David Mancuso and the loft than previously we knew. Yeah. Mancuso passed away in November 2016. But, you know, people still talk with great reverence about those loft parties. So it seems with any kind of influential scene which goes on to lead to something else so we can go all the way back now to the early days of acid acid house in 1987 and everything that that led to there's always a little bit more to know than what yeah. you get from the official story was it really paul oakenfold and his mates going to ibiza and having a great time and bringing it all back was it really dave mancuso having a few mates around his house and playing some great tunes or is there a little bit more to know here yeah, the the way you descri- you know describe the Dave Mancuso loft stuff that what the things that I go to are like updated versions of that. You're having little these warehouses that some people live in. They're lofts basically, and they'll be anywhere from seventy five to a couple of hundred people there. And you just it really is so much about the sound. Like a lot of the parties that I go to have this uh, Function One sound system. Have you heard of this? Mark? Oh, for sure. That's supposed to be the, the state of the art right. system. So the, the, there's p- people talk about like there's been tests done and the function one sound system is uh, said to have been like the produce, able to produce transcendent experiences. So yes, you bring certain people together, especially if you're trying to call together certain types with certain backgrounds who have been surveilled their whole life. You pull them together, you expose them you know what drugs are in the room and you can't necessarily be sure who's taking what, but on a certain level you can be, especially if you have the kind of, you know, um, I think that there's a kind of electronic and technological devices where they can monitor people's, like what their frequency is in their body just by passing them with, you know, one of these instruments, you know what I mean? So you can kind of tell what somebody's on. You can expose them to certain sound frequencies with a certain sound system and you hear you have couple hundred people or sometimes just 75 or 100 in a room staying there for six to eight hours and you have all this opportunity to expose them to a different different sounds different vibrations and watch how they react watch what happens when certain people interact with each other i mean there's all sorts of it it, it is completely what you're it's like it's like a it's, it's like a lab without the coats you know what i mean without the it's a, it's a black lab instead of a white lab you know um, right yeah, I mean, that's and exactly- people don't realize that they're being surveilled in that way to, to, to a large degree, I would say. Maybe one or two would be aware of it. But uh, for the most part, people think they're there to have a great time. Yep. And as I've, said, as I've said many times in previous interviews, the ingenious thing about using the world of entertainment for mind control is that everyone's off their guard. Nobody's expecting to be mind controlled. When you go to a club, when you go out to watch a movie, when you switch on the TV after a hard day at work, nobody's expecting to have cultural belief systems and values and perceptions formed in their minds without their conscious knowledge. You think you're just unwinding and having a great time. That's what's so ingenious about it. That's why they use the entertainment industry to the degree that they do. Yeah, absolutely. I want to relate something that's actually from a different part of your book to this. And actually, because you brought up Max Spears, it's a perfect, uh, perfect segue. But um, what, hold on just a second. I, I, uh, in your book, uh, you, in a, you were talk, there's a part where you're talking about um, uh, Danny Carey from, uh, from Tool. And you were talking about, uh, there's a quote from what he says um, from a book about his, uh, or, so, I'm just going to read this quote. It says this, relatively normal, an element of mystery was added to Danny's childhood when one day he spied his father with a large sword conducting a Masonic ritual. Danny would later notice himself performing similar movements when he began playing drums at the age of 13. Despite not becoming a Mason or aligning himself with any other school of religion, Danny has maintained his heritage's interest in occult studies. Endeavors into this realm have manifested periodically, such as the time he achieved insight into a hidden aspect of the unicursal hexagram, utilizing an astral journey initiated through meditation and DMT. 
He then performed a ritual utilizing his newfound knowledge of the unicursal hexagram to generate a pattern of movement in space. The resulting rhythm and gateway summoned a daemon he has contained within the lodge that has been delivering short parables similar to passages within the Book of Lies. Danny recommends as a device of protection and containment a thorough study and utilization of the underlying geometry of the Temple of Solomon for anyone purchasing their next record. So I thought that was interesting in relation to what we've talked about with um, uh, the, the, the visions that people have. You and I have talked about, I told you about when I would close my eyes when I was dancing and I would see, uh, you know, all of these geometric forms, right? And one of the things Max Spears also talked about was he talked about, and, and he was talking about this right before he died, he was talking about the key of Solomon. And here you're talking about, uh, he, the, Dan, they're referring to the Temple of Solomon and its underlying geometries. And he's talking about his experiences through meditation and DMT. And if you look at the artwork of Alex Gray, who does the artwork for Tool for their CDs and, and whatnot, it's all of this metaphysical kind of, um, uh, art, DMT, entheogenic art. And these are the kinds of visions that people are having. And now you're seeing them on the screens at these events. And it, it's just making me wonder, you know, the key of Solomon has to do with uh, elements of pedophilia and sodomy related to it. And if you redo some research on the key of Solomon and the temple of Solomon or the house of the strong man, part of the reason for doing this is to create people that are able to have visions. And the underlying geometry of the temple of Solomon is very similar to the kinds of visions that I have and that are being projected on the screens at these festivals right now. And so it really makes me wonder if, you know, really how deep and dark this is and, and what the purpose of these underlying, you know, I know the geometry is just geometry, but it, you know, so many things can be passed through that. And I thought that was interesting. And since you brought up Max Spears, I wanted to bring that there. I actually think when I speak about the sacred geometry of space, time and sound, that that's sort of what they're trying to create here is like a temple of Solomon kind of thing. Do you have any further, you know, have, do, you, do you know what I'm talking about with that? Yeah, I know what you're getting at. And I think, again, it is just a good idea to consider the long game in all this, because the controllers yeah. that we're talking about play the long game, and they plan their moves years and decades in advance. So again, going back to those early days of the acid house scene, everything has to have a plausible beginning. So yeah. if you're going to have a massive worldwide electronic dance music scene that's beaming subliminals into people's minds and is going in tandem with other changes in society, you have to be able to say where it came from. So everything has this benign sounding cover story as to what the origin were and it's just supposed to have grown from there but I think it's perfectly conceivable that 30 years ago the uh, controllers of society knew exactly where things were going to be in 2018 and beyond yeah and they made their moves on a gradual basis to bring everything to where they wanted it to be uh, it was planned a long time in advance so they knew what kind of state society was going to be in yeah. by this point and they helped to pave the way towards it that would be my my thought on that. Yeah. But I yeah. know you wanted to close out the first hour and move on. So uh, yeah, that, All right. that's yeah. So we've got, that kind of brings us to the end of the first hour. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, uh, we're going to talk uh, Prince George Michael and the strangeness of '80s music and pop videos. Stay with us. This is Off Planet Radio. Oh, before we go on the first hour, Mark, tell people where they can find you. Okay, and I just want to say it's really refreshing for me to do an interview where I don't talk about Paul McCartney. <laughs> I'm a little. I'm getting a little tired of being asked about Paul McCartney now, so it's great to have a show off from that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Anyway, the book is Musical Truth, Volume 2. There is some stuff about Paul McCartney in it. Uh, it's now available on Amazon. There's a paperback, a hardback, and a Kindle version. You can look for it on Amazon. If people want to hit me up individually to get a, tra uh, get a book mailed out to them, then you can email me on markdevlinuk at gmail.com. Just drop me an email there. If you could pay by PayPal, I could put a signed copy in the post to you. I do post overseas, so that's all good. It's markdevlinuk at gmail.com, and we can make it happen that way. And you can find both Mark and I at the Mystic Journey Bookstore for an evening of musical truth on Wednesday, March 14th in Venice Beach, California. Please join us. We'll see you on the other side. Oh, 
Oh, no.